I'm up here, so I must be talking about marriage. Because usually when I, when I give a sermon, it usually has that kind of a theme to it. And it's no different this time around. But it's also something that's a message for everybody. But because I'm going to be talking about uh, complacency and, and how it relates to our marriages and how it relates to our relationship with Christ. And even in our relationships with other uh, believers. Uh, the definition of uh, complacency is a feeling of contentment or self-satisfaction, especially when coupled with an awareness, with an unawareness of danger, trouble, or controversy. And uh, it's kind of like the, the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, we might think it's daylight on the other end of the tunnel, and sometimes it's a train coming. So we have to... Uh, Always be prepared. And my favorite scripture on this, uh, my favorite scripture on complacency in the Bible is uh, Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 11. And the first part of this uh, passage talks about the ant and how it prepares in summer for food and to have food and, and things in winter. It has no overseer, no ruler, but yet it still prepares. But then later on, uh, the, the author writes, and he's talking directly to us. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a thief and want like an armed man. So complacency has a component in it that where we, we just don't pay attention. We just kind of fold our hands. We just kind of like are oblivious to what's going on around us. Situational awareness is not a thing when you're complacent. You know, another good uh, scripture that I like uh, about complacency, and this one is Jesus talking to the church uh, of Ephesus in Revelations. And he he enumerates the things that they're doing right, but then he comes down in verse 4 and he says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and re remove your lampstand from its place. Uh, there's another uh, verse in Revelations that I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to reference to it, uh, and that's 3, 15 through 17, where he's talking to the church in Laodicea that, that they're lukewarm and that he would prefer that they be hot or cold instead of lukewarm because he will spew them out of his mouth. So he, see, and I really think the reason he says that is because if, if a person is cold, he can work with them. He can show them, hey, you know, you, you're, you've got a problem here. And if you're you know, hot, obviously you're serving the Lord. But if you're in between, it's hard to convince you of things sometimes. You, you're so wrapped up in doing things that you think are right, but you're not paying attention to things that matter. And so uh, how does all this apply to marriage? Well, I think in marriages sometimes uh, we, can, we can get complacent, especially after we've been married, you know, for any length of time. Uh, you know, when you're first married, you have all this emotion and everything is great. And, uh, but then as time goes on, everything can become a routine. The busyness of life can overtake you. And the next thing you know, you're not paying attention to the things you did at first. And not that you're always going to have that emotion because love is a decision. It's not an emotion. If you are going to rely on your marriage to, or any relationship to have that first, boy, this you know, person is just amazing. Uh, if you and have that emotional love and think that that's going to sustain you for a long period of time, it's not going to. You know, Jesus doesn't love us because we are great people. We are sinners and he loves us anyway. And, and that's really how our love to our spouse should be. It should be a decision. You know, God created marriage. If you look in the book of Genesis uh, in chapter 2, he, he, he lays it out for Adam and Eve and creates it. Uh, and he did it, as he does a lot of things, he did it to create, uh, to glorify himself. And uh, I'm going to read Ephesians uh, 
verse 22 through uh, 5, 22 through 33, or 21 through 33, I think. But anyway, uh, it's important that we understand that our relationship with Christ and that the church's relationship with Christ is to reflect how marriage is supposed to work. And and this scripture uh, lays that out. Out of respect for Christ, and this is the message translation because I like this a little bit better because, uh, and I'll explain it to you here in a minute, but out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church, a love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor, since they're already one in marriage. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds and pampers it. That's how Christ treats us. The church, since we are part of his body, and this is why man leaves his father and mother and cherishes his wife. No longer two, they become one flesh. This is a huge mystery, and I don't pretend to understand it all. What is clearest to me is the way Christ treats the church, and this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself and loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. Now, You know, a lot of people take this passage and they read like the King James Version or the ESV Version and they see the word submit. And they often think, well, man, that's just why the church is so oppressive towards women. But I guarantee you that if a husband is living out his life and his his uh, the way he treats his wife as Christ is treating the church, she's not going to feel oppressed at all because he's going to be honoring her and he's going to be putting her needs above his own. Uh, So wives respect and honor, but it's not a domineering thing. Uh, Complacency can destroy this relationship. And uh, there's some components of it that uh, come about as time goes on, we start to get lazy. And we can get lazy in our relationship with Christ and we can get lazy in that relationship with our wife. You know, if we get lazy in our relationship with Christ, we may stop reading the Bible. We may start stop praying. We may stop going to church. We'll just kind of say, well, I don't really, you know, I, I often hear people say, well, I don't need to go to church to, have a, to be a Christian. No, you don't. But God wants you to. It tells you to in the Bible. And so you can get lazy and say, okay, well, I'm just, I'm not going to spend time in the word. I'm not going to spend time praying. I'm not going to spend time worshiping. And the next thing you know, you're going to start drifting away from God. You're going to lose that affection for him. And it's always you that moves away from God. That's the one difference in a marriage. Two people can move away. But in a relationship with Christ, it's always you that are moving away, if you're moving away. Because God never leaves you. He never forsakes you. But you can, you can forsake him. Another component of uh, complacency is a lack of communications. Again, Talking and praying with the Lord is a way that you stay in communication with him. Uh, In marriage, you have to spend time talking. You have to spend time understanding each other. And and if if you're so busy in life that you're running in and out of uh, the house all the time and you're not paying attention to each other, you won't communicate and you'll drift apart because of that. Again, another component of complacency. Selfishness. Uh, with your will, your time, your work, your hobbies, your resources, your money. You know, if you're not helping the, uh, God's kingdom with your resources, if money, you know, you need to start maybe thinking about maybe what, what's going on. Maybe you're drifting away from God. Maybe you used to be a, a tither or someone who gave a lot to the church, but then you just said, well, you know, I'm just, I don't feel like doing that no more. Or you spend a lot of time working in ministry and you say, well, I'm just kind of tired of doing that. Uh, And your will. You know, you can be selfish with your will. 
you can say, you know, I know God would rather me do this, but I think I'm going to go in this direction because it's what I want to do. Number four that I have written down here is unrealistic expectations in a marriage. Sometimes, and also you can have an, unexpe- uh, an unrealistic expectation of what a relationship with Christ is going to be. Oftentimes we, we walk into a relationship uh, in marriage and we expect the person to be perfect. And we know that in a relationship with Christ that he is perfect, but we don't understand the expectations. We have wrong expectations. We think that, okay, I'm going to become a Christian and everything's going to be perfect. I'm not going to have any trouble. Uh, I probably won't get sick anymore now that I'm a Christian. And it's foolishness. It's foolishness. But yet that happens. We say sometimes to ourselves, why is this going on in my life when I'm a Christian? Because he doesn't promise us we're not going to have trouble in this world. Matter of fact, he says the opposite. He says we will have trouble in this world. But, but, but do not fear because he has overcome the world. And, you know, in our... In our marriages, we fail, fail to see ourselves as realistically as we should and our spouse. You know, when we got married, we didn't marry a perfect person. You know, uh, Jesus is the only human being he became, who God be, who became human being to walk the face of, of earth and not sin and not have any issues like we all do. And so we have to understand that when we're in a marriage that our spouse isn't perfect and neither are we. The results of complacency are a loss of affection. As I stated earlier about our relationship with Christ, we can lose affection for him. And if we are complacent in our marriage, we'll lose affection for each other. Just because the the lack of time, the laziness, the not doing the things, not being vigilant, that will all result in that. You'll have a lack of grace and mercy. You'll find out that you're... You're annoyed by every little thing your spouse does sometimes. You know, things that, you know, you say, why does she do that or why does he do that? And, you know, you get angry about it, overtly angry. You know, you get say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And, and then it, it sits inside of you and it'll result in unforgiveness. And I'm telling you, I'm going to spend time on this part because it's really, really important. Uh, if you have unforgiveness in your marriage, you have, have a, you have a real problem. If you have unforgiveness at all in your walk with Christ towards other people, you have a real problem. Because, uh, you know, Jesus tells us in Matthew 6 that if we don't forgive others, he's not going to forgive us. And that's a critical, critical thing. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of sin that needs forgiven in my life. And I want to make sure that it's forgiven. So I'm going, to, I'm going to try my best to be a good forgiver. But sometimes what happens is you get complacent and you're with somebody all the time. So you, don't, you just assume that, well, he forgives me for that or she forgives me for that. Uh, unforgiveness is a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, another result is compromised values. You start compromising on things that you know are the right thing to do and you don't do them because you get lazy. And then finally, you give up. You give up on the relationship. You say, well, this is just the way it is. This is the way it's going to be, and I'm just not going to change it. So I'm just going to accept mediocrity, or I'm just going to accept this miserableness, if you will. And soon the the relationship is destroyed because of it. Now, how do we avoid complacency? And this is the important part, uh, because we have to be vigilant, both in our relationship with Christ in our relationship with our our spouse. Number one is be unselfish. I'm going to read, and this is an important thing, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 13, 4, and 5, and and I'm going to use uh, this for this part and the next part, but uh, it reads, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It does not, it is not easily angered and it keeps no records of wrongs. Now, on the unselfish part, it's not self-seeking. It doesn't have to have its way all the time. Uh, oftentimes, we, uh, there's things that we know that our wife would like to do or our husband would like to do 
and we don't do it. Like your husband may want you to go to a football game with him or a baseball game or go fishing. And we say, well, I'm not doing that. I'll never do that. And so you don't do it. Uh, I, I want to give you an example of this. This is kind of funny. Uh, Gloria, since we've been married, she always wanted to go and get one of those pictures taken, you know, where you, you're in, you dress up in the old time clothes and it's a black and white picture and, you know. And so I always resisted it. I would never do it. So three or four years ago, we were in Branson, Missouri, and there was a place there that you go in there and you dress up like the old west, you know, and get your picture taken with the cop. And, and Kirk knows me well. He's laughing because he knows that's not who I am, you know. And uh, so she wanted to do that, and I was saying, no, I don't want to do that. And her sister and her husband, her her, his sister, her sister, her husband, her sister's husband wanted to do it, and I, and I didn't, and I kept saying, no, I don't want to do this. So finally, I said, okay, I agreed to it, because I knew it would please her. Sure. So I went in there, and we started to get dressed and everything, and I'm looking at this cowboy hat, and I go, <laughs> the five-year-old in me was saying, but I don't want to be a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> but... But my point is, is that I did it anyway, even though I didn't feel comfortable doing it because I knew it would please my wife. And so we have to think that way in our relationship with our spouse. So sometimes we do things we don't want to do. Not, and I'm not talking about doing bad things. I'm talking about dressing up like a cowboy, you know. <laughs> well, the picture's a, a family heirloom now. So, you know, my children, whenever my children want to make fun of me, they pull it out of their album but the sec so be unselfish the second thing is to forgive don't harbor this it's so important again Matthew 6 Jesus says don't do this and the way you can know that if you've really forgiven somebody and and look at look at your marriages over a length of time you know there have been times in our marriage where Gloria and I hurt each other profoundly profoundly but yet we forgave each other, and the way, one of the ways you know that you might still be holding unforgiveness is if every little thing your spouse does annoys you. You could always are finding fault. You're always finding things that anger you about them because you're looking for them. And it's because you have unforgiveness for something in the past. It happens all the time in marriage. I see it all the time. There's some great hurt that happened that, the husband has asked for forgiveness or the wife has asked for forgiveness because it can be both sides. And it's, it's been said that it's been said, okay, I forgive you, but that forgiveness isn't in your heart. And so what happens is, is that every time something comes up, that comes back into your mind and you don't necessarily bring it up because you said you told that person I forgave you. So you can't, but yet you're holding this in your heart. And I, I'm telling you, you haven't reconciled with that person. That could be your spouse. And this could be going on for 15 or 20 years. And, and, and you still have unforgiveness over something or resentment over something. Let it go. I mean, when you forgive, it want, God wants us to make it genuine. He doesn't want it to be superficial or just in words. Another way that we can <clears throat> fight complacency is to spend time. Again... Like in our relationship with Christ, we have to spend time in prayer. We have to spend time with his people. We have to spend time reading his word. That's how he communicates with us. That's how he draws us closer to him. And so we need to be, able, be willing to do that. We have to be willing to sacrifice. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's funny. You know, you'll hear a husband that will say, you know, I would die. I'd jump in front of a train for my wife. And I'm sure they would, but, but then, you know, the wife will say, hey, can, can we do something Saturday instead of, going, instead of going golfing? And they'll say, you know I like to golf on Saturday. We'll just, uh, we'll just do something another time. I'm going to go golfing. And I'm not saying you have to give up your hobbies or anything, but be willing to sacrifice those things for your spouse. You know, if you're, if you're a, a wife who's involved in crocheting and you just want to go to the uh, some kind of crocheting class or, or some kind of uh, hobby that you're involved in and you won't give that up for a weekend with your husband or your, if you're a husband and you like to golf or hunt or fish and you won't give up 
a regular routine so that you can spend a special time with your spouse, you're not, you're not living sacrificially towards them. You're not loving them sacrificially. We have to pray. And I, again, I mentioned praying to God, but we have to pray with our spouse. And I'm telling you, this is a really important thing and a really good thing to do. And I find in, in our marriage it helps us so much to, to be in harmony. Not that we're perfect, because there's times we don't pray together, but we try to work at doing it because it's really hard to fight and be at odds with someone that you're praying for and with every day. It really is. It's really an important thing. Another way is to listen. Uh, communicate and truly listen. Uh, don't interrupt while they're talking. You know, Proverbs 18, 13 says, If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. So I know there's been times in my life when Gloria's been talking and, and I'll be, she'll be right in mid-sentence and I'll finish the sentence and give the answer. You know, and we do that occasionally to each other. But yet that's not really a good practice to do because sometimes somebody might be communicating something and you're thinking something else in the back of your mind and they have a completely different idea. And, and what they want to convey is completely different than what you were thinking it was going to be. But you get that familiarity that you think you know your spouse so well. But the, the truth is, is we'll never really know each other as well as Jesus knows us. And the thing about it is we need to understand that. So there's going to be things like we, I've been married, Gloria and I have been married 51 years. We still learn stuff about each other, even now. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing because it means we're paying attention. And, you know, hopefully we keep doing it. We're not, again, we're not perfect. Everything I'm saying up here today applies to us too. Uh, we have to love. Uh, our marriages as believers should be different. They should be different. I mean, uh, not that it's, they're going to be perfect because nobody has a perfect marriage, not even Christians. But I like Romans 12, verse 9 through 10, where it says in, in verse 9, uh, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And that's the key. Put your spouse above yourself. Always. Never put yourself first. If we can do that, uh, it's going to go a long way in avoiding complacency in our marriage and in relationships that we have with other people. Walk in humility. Then, again, this goes along with love. Uh, be willing to remove the log from your own eye before you take the speck out of your spouse's eye. Uh, you're not going to change anyone by berating them and criticizing them, and uh, constantly on them about some little annoying thing that you don't like, or even if it's a, a bigger thing. But uh, but we have to we have to be encouraging. That's how you change people. You encourage them, and you pray for them. And you don't you don't criticism is not going to change somebody. Only prayer and encouragement will change them. And God's word and, and them being willing to do that. Philippians 2, 3, through th 3 and 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. So put yourself second to your spouse, always. Always. Grant grace and mercy, always. Don't get upset because your husband leaves the socks on the floor sometimes. Don't be upset with your wife because the dishes aren't done right after dinner. I mean, I'm not saying those are things that we should be doing, but, but that is not something to get really angry about. It really isn't. Not in the grand context of things because it is such a small, minor thing, but we can let stuff bother us, and, and for different reasons. Like I said earlier about... Forgiveness. And forgiveness is so important. You know, uh, I spoke about forgiveness back in September, and I think Pete did during that time, too. Some, and we, we approach it from different aspects, but it's such an important part of our walk. Both, and it's an important part of our marriage, too. You better be a good forgiver if you're going to be married. Uh, and Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, 
bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. By granting grace and mercy and not getting upset over little things, we're going to maintain peace in our household. Because, you know, if you, like if I leave my shoes out, and, or Gloria leaves her shoes out, and, and one of us complains about it. Usually with me, it's the shoes. With her, it's her socks. So, but if we complain about it enough, it's, it starts to be a lot bigger issue than it should be. You know, you can mention it, but, but don't let that make you mad. That's just a dumb thing to be mad about, you know. Uh, you know, it, in, it, the thing about it is God overlooks so much in our life. We should be able to overlook the little things in our spouse's life. Finally, be thankful. You know, good, a good exercise is, is to someday sit down and, and write on a piece of paper all the things about your spouse that you are thankful for. Yes. Write down the things that are positive about them that is a blessing to you that they are that way. And if you... And you should be able to list a lot of them. And, and then when you look at those things, thank God for them. Thank God for your spouse. And be thankful to him for, for all the blessings he's given you, but be thankful for your spouse. Because I know that there are things about them that are positive and good. And you should concentrate on those things and try to overlook the little things in there that, that annoy you. Because we all have those about us. We are, God, God forgives us for so much that we should be so quick to forgive our spouse of anything, including deep hurts, because he's forgiven us of some very bad things. I know in my life he has, and I know, you know, Gloria and I would agree that, that we have both hurt each other seriously in our marriage at, you know, years ago, and we forgave each other for that time. And it has, it has really helped us a lot. Our marriage is better now than it was when we were first married. And the reason is, is forgiveness. That is a that is like a, a, a vaccine for anything that's wrong in a marriage. Finally, my hope is that we'll be vigilant to not allow complacency and laziness and, and inattention uh, to become part of our marriages uh, because that's what causes long-term problems. I think sometimes what happens is a, a marriage will become complacent within and, and one day one of the spouses finally just breaks out and says, I've had enough of this. I'm done. And I've seen it happen. And it's, it's a sad, sad state to be in. And it all started because years before that, they started drifting apart because they weren't paying attention. So have these conversations. Think about them when you, when you uh, go home today and, say, and look at yourself and talk to each other and say, are, are there, there are ways in our marriage that are becoming complacent? Are we becoming uh, apart because we're too busy to spend the time not only with our spouse or with each other, but with God? And, and we have to do it together. And we have to be able to have these conversations without turning it into arguments. Because if you turn it into an argument, it's not going to accomplish anything. But if we have these conversations and we can communicate... And we can spend the time together and do the things we need to do to make our marriages strong. We can have strong, godly marriages. I'm going to close in some prayer and I'll let Herc take over then. Lord, Lord, we love, we love you so much. We thank you so much for, for blessing us with your son, Lord. And we, we love you for the, the direction that you give us. Lord, we just ask that you would help us to prevent complacency from taking over in our lives, both in our relationship with you and our relationship with our spouse, Lord God. I pray that we would just take these words and apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name.